Today's episode is gonna be a little bit more random. I don't have any finished objects to share with you guys, but I do have a couple of whips that I am really excited about and I wanted to kind of talk about the progress that I'm making with both of those. And I've also been doing a little bit of exploring here in my town of Concord, North Carolina, and I thought I would take you along with me and just share some of the things that are just bringing me so much joy right now. Let me introduce myself to you if you've never been here before. My name is Elise from the blog LePetitSaintCrochet.com and today I've got a couple of whips that I am so excited about and I just need to talk to somebody about them. I also went on a shopping spree for books at a local bookstore that is one of the cutest bookstores I've ever been to and it just happens to be in my town of Concord, North Carolina. So I'm gonna take you guys with me and then share the books that I got because I think you might like some of these. And also I'm gonna take you on a little tour of a local garden. I've brought you there before in one of my other videos, but I didn't share the history behind it. And just as a side note, this is not just a garden, it's actually a cemetery. I love hanging out in cemeteries that may seem really weird, but I find them super peaceful. And this one is just so gorgeous. So I hope you guys like this episode and let's go ahead and jump right in with whip number one. So whip number one is a little over halfway finished because I have finished one sock and I have another sock that is about a quarter of the way done. You may have heard me talk about this sock before, but I am so excited that I actually have almost finished this pair of socks because this was a big challenge for me. It's something that I didn't know if I was going to be able to pull this one off, but I am so pleased with how it's turned out. I'm taking a class from Patricia from Natography Farm and I'll leave a link for it in the description box below in case you are interested in traditional Norwegian knitting, which I am. I'm not Norwegian at all, but I find this type of knitting so exciting and challenging and it's just everything that I'm looking for right now. And so I'm really having a lot of fun. I will probably finish these socks just as the temperatures really begin to warm up here in North Carolina. So I'm not really sure that I'm going to be able to really wear these socks for a little while, but at least they'll be done. Now you can see I've got a couple of ends still to weave in and I haven't blocked them yet, but you can see that I've got the cuff done and then all of the beautiful stranded knitting that's here in this beautiful motif. And I'm gonna turn it around and kind of show you. So on the sides are these little poles and Patricia calls them stolpa. They're here on the sides of the sock. So they go all the way from the top, all the way down here. Then for the heel, you do a little bit of textured knitting here, which was actually really fun. And then for the gusset, you start creating these little stripes here, which is really fun. And then you actually have another design here on the bottom of the foot. I can't tell you how excited I was when I got kind of past this point and I realized that I hadn't messed the sock up. And once I finished it, I was in my kitchen dancing around. I put the sock on and I was so excited. And then it dawned on me that I was going to have to knit another one. Uh, I don't know why that that hadn't occurred to me before that guess what? You knit one, then you have to knit the other one. <laughs> so I felt a little defeated about that for just a minute. But then I thought, okay, this this one's going to go a lot quicker because this one took me a long time to knit, a lot longer than I actually thought it would. Um, it actually made me realize why people must have welcomed the Industrial Revolution because who has time to sit and knit a sock for 10 hours? At least I don't and I seriously doubt women back in the past had that kind of time either. They had a lot of other things they needed to do. But I am really excited about this beautiful sock and I'm going to show you what happened which is sort of interesting with the second sock. 
So here is sock number two. At first I thought it was just my eyes. Maybe I wasn't really looking at it correctly, but I started to feel like, wow, this sock looks a little bit smaller. It must be that I'm just used to seeing the whole sock together. But then I actually got my first sock out and I put them up next to each other and realized, um, this second sock is actually smaller than the first sock. I really think it actually comes down to some things that I've noticed about my tension. And this may be interesting to you as well, and maybe you're like me, that when I'm comfortable knitting, I'm actually a tighter knitter than when I am learning how to do something. I tend to be looser, which I think is maybe not the norm. I think most of the time people are really tight when they're learning how to knit something, but I'm the exact opposite. I'm loose and I just don't feel very confident. So I think I'm purposefully being really careful about my tension when I'm trying to learn how to knit something. And then once I'm confident, I'm able to get Get to my more natural tension, which is a little bit tighter. So we're going to see how this turns out. I really hope that these still fit me because I really don't want to make a third sock, but this one is going much faster than the first one did. And that's just because I haven't had to go back and watch all the video lessons doing this one. I can actually just sit and stitch. And what's interesting about this yarn is that it's not soft at all. This is actually wool from Patricia's own sheep. She lives in Norway and has her own sheep farm and she spins her own wool and it's not soft. It actually feels a little bit coarse when you're touching it at first. What I do love about it though is that when I put the sock on, it doesn't feel scratchy at all. It feels wonderful. Oh my gosh, I'm really excited about how these socks feel. Another thing that's great about this yarn is that say for instance, one of the stitches falls off of the needle, which always gives me a bit of a heart attack. The stitch does doesn't just slip all the way down, which is wonderful. It's got a little toothiness to it, I guess would be the correct term. And it just kind of stays in place a little bit so you can stick your needle right back on, which I'm very thankful for. And it hasn't happened very often, but when it has, I have been like, ooh, so glad that this isn't some super soft, silky yarn that just falls all apart. Anyway, if you're interested in any of the Natography classes, I will leave a link for Natography Farm in the description box below. And I really have a feeling that some of this Norwegian style knitting is going to translate into some new projects that I'm working on, which is a good transition for the next whip I have. In 2021, I designed the Three Little Pig pattern and the Not So Big Bad Wolf, and I had so much fun with them, and I kind of took a little break from designing because I just didn't really know what to do, and I just wanted to do some other projects. The designing bug bit me again, and I'm working on a new design, and it is nowhere near being finished. It's a total whip, and let me get it for you. I want you guys to see it. This is the current state of this new design, and I'm not really sure where this is going yet. One of the reasons that the head is only halfway finished is that I actually ran out of yarn, which you see the yarn attached here, but I'm actually holding two yarns together. This is the Rowan Kid Classic, and I have the Rowan Kid Silk Haze, which is a very fine mohair to give it that really fuzzy texture. I ran out. I thought for certain that I would have enough to finish this little project, and I was wrong. So now I sit here and impatiently wait for the shipment of yarn to get here. But what's really fun about this is that I've played around with this design a little bit. I've changed the shoes because this one is going to be a girl. At least that's how I'm feeling right now. And I know some Amigurumi designers love to sketch out and they know exactly what they're going to make before they get out their yarn and their hook and they start stitching. And that is not me at all. I am just the kind of person that I get the crochet hook out and the knitting needles and I start going and I figure it out as I go. I'm just winging it. One of the things that I'm actually doing is playing around with the shape of the head because I don't even know what animal this is going to be yet. I have an idea in my mind for two different animals and what I'm going to do is go ahead, finish the head. I've done some different shaping with it and once I get the shaping done, I think I'm going to just make two different style ears. What that's going to do is help me to decide which animal this really looks more like. Is this more like 
like animal A or more like animal B. And um, it may turn out to be neither one of those and I may have to go in a completely different direction. But I do think that I'm going to use some of the Norwegian design inspiration for the clothing for this one. And I've got the three little pigs and the not so big bad wolf and all of them are boys and I really want a little girl this time. So I'm just going to be playing around. I'm having so much fun with it. This is just one of those things that I've allowed myself to take my time. I'm not rushing. I'm not trying to publish this at a certain time, but that kind of leads me to something that I did want to talk to you guys about. And it's an idea that's been kind of running through my head recently. I don't know if you follow Katie Livings on Instagram. She is such a talented maker and what she does is she sews mostly bunny rabbits, but she's done nurses and I'm thinking she did a fairy maybe. She does Christmas stockings and they're all, they're just beautiful. She adds so many details to these projects and then she just sells them. She doesn't sell patterns. If you saw my video from last week, I talked a little bit about when I was taking custom orders for knitted and crocheted toys. It just got me thinking about when I was selling toys and how much I enjoyed making toys for other people and packaging them up and shipping them off. And it was just a really fun experience. And I've watched Katie Living's do all of this. She shares a lot about it on her Instagram and she makes all these beautiful little details and she personalizes them for people. Then she puts them up for sale and they literally sell out in a hot second. And I can't purchase them because people beat me to it every single time. I just started to think about maybe I would like to start selling some finished toys again. I don't know yet. It's something that I'm going to be kind of playing around with and I have a tendency to change my mind a lot. So I may say right now that I'm going to sell all these toys and then two weeks from now I'm going to say no. But I just kind of wanted to share that with you guys. I know that there are many of you out there who sell finished toys and there is a lot of joy in doing that, but I am determined not to let it stress me out because I get stressed out about the dumbest things. I let little things get into my head and I start stressing out needlessly and then I just quit doing what I'm doing. So I'm determined that if I am going to start selling finished toys again to just let it be stress-free, let it be fun, don't worry about it because if nobody wants to buy them then I'll just hoard them all and keep them and give all of my future grandchildren tons and tons of knitted and crocheted animals. I would love to know what you think if you think I should should sell finished toys or if you think I should just stay in my lane, don't go back to where you were before and just keep producing patterns and making other people's patterns. It's 2022 and I'm up for doing new things. Let me just say I had so much fun going book shopping. So let me go back and explain why I went to the bookstore in the first place. I've really been reflecting on what really, there, there went the book. I talk with my hands too much, so I have to keep one hand on the books or they're gonna fall off. I've been reflecting on what fills up my cup because I think the last couple of years have depleted me in so many ways and I imagine that there are many of you who feel the same way, that it's just taken so much out of us, all of the craziness that's happened around the world and I know so many of you like me who have had family members who have had major medical issues and just the stress of the last two years has made me feel very depleted. I've just been depleted of my energy and I just needed to kind of step back a little bit and start thinking about what brings me joy, what fills up my cup. And one of the things that I used to spend a lot of time doing before social media, like when my children were little, was I was a major reader. I was a big fan of the Oprah Book Club back in the day and I just found so much joy in reading. And I wanted to get back to that, but sometimes trying to find a book online is extremely difficult. I'm on Goodreads and then I go and look at Amazon reviews and there's actually a few great YouTube channels that are more called BookTube where they're all about books, but it's still kind of difficult to know 
am I going to like that book or not? So we have a local bookstore called Goldberry Books and it's actually owned by an adorable couple. They have five kids, I think. They're the cutest little brunette kids you ever saw in your life. Oh my gosh, they are the cutest little family, but they opened this bookstore right in our downtown area. We have a really cute little historic downtown that is getting revamped and getting a little makeover, which is really fun. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go down there and I had heard about this book called Shady Hollow. And once I read what it was about, I knew that this was going to be the book for me. And I'm going to actually, I'm going to read the little description for you because this is the cutest book ever. I'm, I have high hopes for this book. Let me get my glasses on because I'm really blind without them. The first book in the Shady Hollow series in which we are introduced to the village of Shady Hollow, a place where woodland creatures live together in harmony until a curmudgeonly toad turns up dead and the local reporter has to solve the case. Reporter Vera Vixen has a nose for news, so when she catches wind that the death might be a murder, she resolves to get to the bottom of the case no matter where it leads. As the fox stirs up still waters, she exposes more than one mystery and discovers that additional lives are in jeopardy. Vera's investigations unearth more about this town than anyone ever suspected. It seems someone in the hollow will do anything to keep her from solving the murder, and soon it will take all of Vera's cunning and quickness to crack the case. I cannot wait to start this one. Oh my gosh, if I had a genre of books that I could invent, it would be Woodland Creature Co cozy mystery. And guess what? Someone already wrote it. This is by Juno Black, which actually turns out to be two women who are writing it together. And I cannot wait to start this one. And the reason why I haven't started it is because I started this other book first. It is Maisie Dobbs by Jacqueline Winspear. And it's the first book in a series. And basically what it's about, it's a young girl who kind of has a difficult start in life, but an aristocratic family recognizes this extraordinary intellect that she has while she's working for them in their home. And one of their friends is a private investigator for the elite in London. And he really begins to see in her an extraordinary talent for noticing details and being able to figure out difficult situations. He mentors her and she is able to develop this skill that she has, this natural talent. And then World War I happens and she's whisked away to France and she is a nurse. And that plays a theme within the book as well. But a lot of it is her solving these little mysteries, which is really fun. Now the next book is, they're all mysteries. I'm just gonna give it away. The next book is The Beekeeper's Apprentice by Lori R. King. And this book is about Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes and a young girl who forges a friendship with him. She's an orphan and he notices her natural abilities and they form a partnership. And the two of them are called upon to solve the case of a missing American senator's daughter. This one was also highly recommended and I actually went and looked up reviews for each one of these books and they all have amazing reviews. So I'm really excited to read this one as well. And then the last one is The Christmas affair which is a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. This one looks so interesting. It's about Agatha Christie and there was a period of 11 days where she went missing and that actually happened in real life and there is a lot of mystery surrounding what actually happened to her during those 11 days. Well this is a fictional story about what might have happened to her, what was going on and it's full of intrigue and mystery and it looks like it's going to be a really, really good one. One of my favorite things to do when I'm in downtown Concord is to go to Memorial Garden. This is one of my favorite spots. And every spring I love to go over and see what's blooming. It's just so beautiful. But what's great about this place is that it is open to the public, but it is still owned by a Presbyterian church here in Concord, but also it's a cemetery. I don't know why 
July. I love a beautiful old cemetery. There's just something very peaceful about it and this one is probably my favorite cemetery. But I wanted to read a little bit of the history of Memorial Garden and this is actually from the church's website. Located on Spring Street in downtown Concord, Memorial Garden sits on land purchased in 1804 for the original log cabin sanctuary of First Presbyterian Church. Although the church buildings have long since moved, the garden continues to be a cherished and beloved part of the congregation's history and heritage. Stone paths wind throughout the church's 200-year-old cemetery, guiding visitors up and down gently sloping hillsides, past ancient oaks, waterfalls, butterflies, sculpted hollies, and intricately carved white Italian marble markers. The current chapter of Memorial Garden began in 1930 when Mrs. Sally Pfeiffer Williamson committed herself to restoring the church's cemetery as a memorial to her mother. Renaming the plot Memorial Garden, she faithfully maintained and improved the grounds until her death in 1937. Her son, Marshall Pfeiffer Williamson, continued his mother's work on the garden until his own death in 1966. Today, the family's work and dedication continues through a generous trust endowed by Mr. Williamson to support the garden. I hope you found some inspiration today in this random video about my works in progress and some of the things that I'm enjoying right now. But I would love to know what's really sparking your joy right now. What is filling your cup? What's making you feel excited about life again? I would love to know. Please leave those suggestions in the comment section below. And you'll find links for everything that I talked about in the description box below as well. And I hope that you all are having a wonderful spring season season right now. Or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you guys are in early fall, which just kind of boggles my mind that we can be in two completely different seasons. But anyway, thank you guys so much for stopping by today, and I hope you all stay safe out there, and happy stitching!